Welcome to UO Today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is George Lakoff, world-renowned linguist and progressive political analyst. George Lakoff is a professor of cognitive linguistics at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also the co-founder of the Rockridge Institute, a progressive think tank. His areas of research include the influence of metaphors on the way men and women conceptualize, the practical application of cognitive linguistics to social and political issues, cognitive science and philosophy, and the cognitive structure of mathematics. He has published numerous articles in scholarly journals. He's the author of several books, including Metaphors We Live By, co-authored by Mark Johnson and published in 1980, Moral Politics, Politics 1996, Philosophy in the Flesh, also co-authored by Mark Johnson, 1999, Whose Freedom, 2006, and Thinking Points, also 2006. He's on campus to give a lecture on the brain and its politics. What a strange combination of, of uh, topics, politics and the brain. Be great to hear you on that subject. Well, uh, the most interesting thing about it is that it's all relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there's another book coming out uh, in about a month called The Political Mind, um, Why You Can't Understand 21st Century Politics with an 18th Century Brain. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that title is this. Uh, back in the days of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, when the country was founded, there was a view of the mind that took hold, and it's very popular even today. Uh, it's a view that goes like this, and many people hold it. It says, thought is unconscious, as conscious. It's all there. You know what you think. Thought is conscious. Its reason is dispassionate, unemotional. Its lo reason is logical. That reason can just fit the world as it is. That is, it's literal. That it's uh, universal. We all reason the same way. That uh, reason is disembodied. It's abstract. And that it's interest-based. It's there to serve your self-interests. Every part of it's false that what we've learned in cognitive science and in neuroscience over the past 30 years is every single piece is false. Mm -hmm. So um, take the idea that reason is conscious. It's 98% unconscious. It's what your brain is doing when you're filled with consciousness. But most of it isn't, is, you know, is not accessible to conscious thought. Uh, take the idea that it's dispassionate, that, uh, reason in, that reason is interfered with by emotion. It's the reverse. You can't be rational without being emotional. And this was shown by um, Antonio Damasio in a book called Descartes' Error. Uh, Tony Damasio uh, you know, works on people who have uh, brain damage, strokes, you know, problems of that sort. And it turns out one form of brain damage is when you can't feel emotions, when the part of the brain that allows you to feel emotions is damaged. When that happens, you don't know what to want. If you don't know what's one, because you don't know if you're going to be happy, unhappy, because there isn't any happy or unhappy. You don't know if other people are going to ha be happy with you or angry at you. So you have no idea how to function at all. You can't be rational without being emotional. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out we don't just uh, think in terms of logic. We think in terms of metaphors. Uh, Mark Johnson and I have studied metaphorical thought at, at some length. We think in terms of conceptual frames. Uh, many cognitive scientists, uh, especially Charles Fillmore, has, has studied these things. Uh, those are normal modes of thought. They don't just fit the world as it is. Uh, it's not just literal out there. And, um, and it w these things work with a logic of their own. They don't uh, work by formal logic or probabilistic logic or things of that sort. In addition, um, it turns out thought is not just abstract. It isn't free-floating. It's actually based on the way our bodies work. Uh, our ideas are based on that. And we learn this from neuroscience in a very deep way. Uh, back in the 1990s, there was a remarkable discovery, which was that if um, you are imagining something, take a, a, a drawing, and you memorize the drawing and you imagine it, the same part of the brain becomes active as if you see it. And if you remember it, the same part is active. And if you dream that you're seeing, the same part is active as when you're actually seeing. The same with moving. Now, what's interesting about that is that 
suppose I take a sentence like, uh, and by the way, the same is true if I give you a sentence, uh, you know, about seeing something, mm -hmm. then the same part of the brain will be active as well. Uh, we'll, we'll uh, if you go, you'll see the scene. If I give you a sentence like, he took a drink of water, if you don't know what it is to take a drink of water, if you can't even imagine it, you don't understand the sentence. Mm -hmm. What that suggests is that meaning is the capacity for imagination. Meaning is the capacity for activating those parts of the brain that understand all these things through actually seeing or acting, through actually um, uh, imagining, dreaming, remembering, and so on. They're all part of the same system. They're embodied. Any idea you have is physically there in your brain. And then there's the question of, is reason there for self-interest? What was discovered in 1996 in Parma, Italy, was something remarkable, that we have uh, a part of our brain called mirror neurons uh, located uh, in the prefrontal cortex, and then in, they've discovered them in other places, so that if they're fi they fire when we coordinated actions, when I say pick up a glass of water, um, when I do coordinated actions, they'll fire, or when I see someone else do the same action. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is, is that you are connected to other people, mm. but those neurons are connected to emotional regions. So when you, when you feel emotions, your body feels a certain way. If you're happy, you smile. If you're sad, you droop, and so on. That means you can see someone else's body and know what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Empathy is physical. We have inherited the capacity for empathy. It's there in our brains. So actually, reason is very different. It's mostly unconscious. It's emotional. It has emotional ties. And um, people like Damasio have been tracing out pathways linking emotional regions to other, quote, more rational regions of the brain, but they're connected. Uh, the uh, uh, reason is metaphorical. It's not literal. It doesn't just fit the world. Uh, it's uh, not abstract. It's embodied, and it's not based on self-interest. It has everything to do with connecting with other people, with mm -hmm. empathy. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you that, uh, that those are, especially what you said at the end, are very inspiring words. It means we really need to change our, our rhetoric, which, at least in the United States, is based on so much 18th century thought. So what I, what I, my, my question to you is maybe you'll answer this. Where's the hope for America if, if, if so, much, so many of our institutions are sort of based in 18th century thinking and now we live in a world where, uh, where cognitive science has, has, has put us, really has explained reality in a very different way. Where, do we have hope to be able to get from there to, to here at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there was a time when uh, people thought that the sun moved around the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, science can come in and change the way we understand things. Uh, it's effective, uh, it's uh, very important in economics and foreign policy where what's called the rational actor model, which assumes 18th century thought, is b the basis of lots of foreign policy and lots of economic policy. That has to be rethought and is being rethought in the field of behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many academic disciplines that will have to be rethought, and politics especially, because policy making in the political arena uses all those old mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another really important part, which is if you really believe all those things, uh, then you will not think that, w uh, that language is very important. Language, if, there, if 18th century uh, reason were true, language would be transparent. It would just fit the world, but it doesn't. It fits conceptual frames and metaphors. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that if you're in politics and you have an ideology and you can get your ideology out into the world through language and the language gets accepted, that means the frames and metaphors and ideas get accepted. And that's what the right wing in America has done for the past 35 years. Their think tanks uh, have uh, spent basically $4 billion over that period getting their ideas out in public and progressives have not. So you have the most basic ideas, like the idea of security. What, is, what does it mean to be secure? Uh, the idea of the market, the idea of what government is, what taxation is, what religion is, what morality is, what character is, what responsibility is. Those are the ones out there right now in public discourse are the right-wing versions. There are progressive versions out there, and they're not 
as well known. The language hasn't been developed. And the result is that uh, if you believe that language is neutral, you'll accept the right-wing ideas. And many people in the media just do it. They just accept the right-wing view of the market, so-called free market. They'll accept the right-wing view of what counts as security, namely military action, and so on. There are other ideas about all of these things that are progressive, and those ideas have to come out there. But they can't come out unless we get rid of this old notion of reason. Mm -hmm. So even the notion of enlightened self-interest is one that's often used. So what if you were if you were uh, if you had a foreign uh, uh, you were uh, advising people in foreign policy? What about the, what about the world? It's in, if somebody said in your in the cabinet, it's in the self-interest of the United States to invade this country or that country. What, what about that? How would you change that vocabulary of self-interest? It's not just a vocabulary. It's an idea. It's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. We have a metaphor of the nation as a person mm -hmm. out there in a world community. There are rogue states. There are friendly states. There are adult nations and children nations. The underdeveloped nations are the children nations, right? Now, the, in this, you have the idea that every nation is a rational actor in the sense of this old notion that they're all seeking their self-interest. Well, what is the self-interest of a nation? Well, that's metaphorical. The national interest has three components. It has the GDP, economic interest, but defined not with respect to all the P individual people, but the overall GDP, which is mainly corporate America. It is defined relative to military strength, and uh, it is defined relative to political influence. Those are the three things that, that define what is called the national interest. Those are all interests at the level of the state, and foreign policy assumes that every state naturally works in terms of those things and those interests, and that that's good. It's sort of like uh, 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 the classical notion of the economy, whereas everybody seeks their profit, the profit of all will be maximized, and so on. Well, it turns out not to be the case. The most important foreign policy issues in the world are not at the level of the state, but at the level of the person. They have to do with issues of policy. They have to do with issues of climate change. They have to do with uh, questions of disease and public health, uh, of water rights, of all of these things that are not at the level of the state, but affect individual people. And that has to be changed if we are to uh, address you know, our greatest foreign policy problems. Terrorism is not a problem at the level of the state. It's the problem at, at the level of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just backtrack just a bit because our, our, our viewing audience knows that you're, know, knows you as a linguist and the, the study of linguistics. So if you could just give us an idea of what, what uh, uh, drew you to linguistics and how you see the work you're doing now in relation to that field. Well, um, I was interested uh, uh, originally in two things as an undergraduate, mathematics and poetry. Mm -hmm. And I always felt they were the same. And now I know why. <laughs> they both involve conceptual metaphor, metaphorical thought. Uh, but that's not obvious in any way. It took a long time to understand that. I went into linguistics simply because I loved language. And I wanted to understand how the mind worked. I wanted to understand through language how you could get at the workings of, of our, our deepest thoughts. And the remarkable thing is that linguistics has developed in that direction. That's what cognitive linguistics does. It actually allows you, through the study of language, to get at the structure of, the structure of thought. And uh, since you're here in Eugene, I'd like you to comment, if you, if you would, on your collaboration with, uh, with Mark Johnson in the philosophy department, how that began and, 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 and if it's still going, where it's going. Well, we've been collaborating for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been, you know, there, there's no better person in the world, I think, than Mark Johnson, uh, and one of the smartest. Uh, Mark showed up almost on my doorstep at one point in uh, January 2nd, 1979. He had come to Berkeley to uh, uh, take over a couple of courses in the philosophy department for two quarters and had uh, gotten an apartment, which turned out to be three blocks from my house. Uh, he was putting together a bunch of essays on metaphor. Uh, a friend of, a mutual friend had uh, uh, told him on his, when he passed through Chicago that I was interested in that. So he called me up 
as I was going out for my daily cappuccino. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, let's meet at the cafe. And it turned out that he, in his dissertation, had reached the same conclusion that I had, that uh, thought was metaphorical mm -hmm. in a very systematic way uh, for totally different reasons, for philosophical reasons. And so we decided to start working together, and we've been doing it ever since. Uh, the remarkable thing about Mark is this. Um, when we first started looking at this, we, we tried to write a paper on philosophy and metaphor. And the problem was that uh, Anglo-American philosophy, as it was done then and it still is, um, assumes certain things that contradict the facts. So you cannot actually argue with people when you're contradicting the very things that they assume. So you have to change the assumptions, the yeah. background. And so I said to Mark, uh, well, look, um, is there any philosophy that's useful to this? And he said, well, you know, some, Merleau-Ponty, Dewey, and so on, uh, but re not really in any detail. He said, well, I said, well, you're a philosopher. Uh, you know, make up a philosophy. And he laughed. He said, no, come on, philosophers just talk about other people's philosophies. Uh -huh. <laughs> but in fact, what Mark was able to do was uh, because he knew so much about the history of philosophy, was to go in and ask, what are the essential properties of a philosophy? Every philosophy has to have a method. Every philosophy has to answer certain questions and so on. So we sat down and we said, okay, we have a method. It comes out of cognitive science. Uh, there are certain ideas that have to be addressed, like uh, time, events, causation, the mind, the self, morality. Well, it turned out, they had already been studied in their metaphor, they were metaphorical structures. So I said, okay, look, let's write a book on this. And we sat down to outline it, and we looked at the outline, and he laughed. He said, this can't be written. This is an impossible book. Uh, it turned out to take seven and a half years, called Philosophy in the Flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, it's a, a, an amazing testimony to, to Mark. Well, you must have had something to do with it. I want to, I want, I want to talk a little bit about collaboration because you've, you've been talking about how, in a sense, this is really the way things happen, uh, cooperation, collaboration, rather than somebody having yeah. some, right, whatever. And what about, have you, have you reflected uh, on that, on, on the fact that you're doing this collaborative work and its relationship to the things you're, you're understanding about the, about the human brain in relationship to language? Well, uh, I was an undergraduate at MIT, and the first thing you learn there is you don't do it alone. People work in labs. People work with other people. But not in the humanities. Well, <laughs> but that's how it should be mm -hmm. in the humanities. I mean, uh, I uh, come from a scientific tradition mm -hmm. where we work together. And um, I always prefer, I've written some books by myself, but even when they're quote by myself, I'm always talking to other people. Uh, I, you know, uh, I've been working for the past 20 years with uh, Jerry Feldman at Berkeley on uh, a neural theory of language and thought. I mean, here you have the person who figured out how neural computation worked back in the 70s. Uh, we set up a lab, we've had lots of students, and they've learned huge amounts, but you don't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. At the Rockridge Institute, you know, you, I don't do it myself. Uh, you know, you have great people around you, and you talk to them, and you learn from them, and you learn by interacting with them. Uh, and this is generally the way people learn. Uh, you know, if, I, I can't, I'm not a person who just sits alone and stares at the wall and gets ideas. Mm -hmm. so, ha but how do you, so how do you write a book together? Uh, I mean, when you've got, you got this chapter, that chapter, that chapter. No. How do, you, how, do, how, do you, how do you do that? Mark and I have mostly written it sentence by sentence together. Oh, really? Even on the telephone with my phone on my oh. ear, typing. That's very time. No wonder it was seven and a half years. Right. Yeah. yeah. So every sentence is a collaborative, uh, a collaborative uh, there's, there's uh, about, effort. There's about 10 pages or so that were written by each of us separately uh -huh. here and there. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. mostly it's a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first started writing, it was difficult We had because in Metaphors We Live By, we had to ev evolve a common style. We had opposite styles. Mm -hmm. And we started arguing about this. We said, okay, let's, let's figure out what's the best way to do it. And we evolved a common style. And then occasionally, um, this was before there were desktop regular computers. This was uh, when you, he had typewriters. And I'm a fast but bad typist. Uh, Mark is a very good typist. Um, but I compose on the typewriter. So uh, what would happen was I would be sitting there composing, doing the sentence by sentence. And every now and then, we'd have a disagreement. 
and we had a simple rule. If we have a disagreement, I get to write it, but he retypes it the next morning and changes it. <laughs> You know, if he reflects on it that night, if he really thinks it's, it's, it has to be changed, it's his. Yeah. But no serious squabbles along the way. I think we had one. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we won't, we won't go into that. Uh, I don't even uh, remember. I <laughs> uh, framing. You're talking a lot about framing, especially in some of your recent uh, work. And you talk about freedom. Would you, like to, would you like to frame the word freedom for us, especially as it's been used today by the, the current uh, President of the United States. Well, uh, I was actually inspired by his second inaugural address uh -huh. where he used the words freedom, free, and liberty 49 times in 20 minutes. 49 times in 20 minutes. Yeah. And half of those sounded like he was a major progressive. He, you know, could have been, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King. And the other half were totally foreign. They were, you know, things that, that I found appalling. And uh, I knew from the study of what are called contested concepts that freedom was what an essentially contested concept. It's a concept that we cannot get a single agreed upon understanding of because it's partly underspecified and partly uh, it depends on your worldview. So what I did was I tried to understand exactly what Bush meant by freedom and what progressives would mean by freedom. And to do that, I had to go and look at texts over all areas, over foreign policy, over uh, domestic policy, over religion and religious freedom and so on, the full range. And it turned out that um, uh, it, it's actually very simple. Uh, freedom comes uh, in its most elementary form that we all share from freedom of motion. Freedom of action is freedom of motion. So. Uh, you know, you're free to move down the street, to walk down the street, but you're not free to jump on someone else and tie them up. So you can't interfere with someone else's freedom mm -hmm. of motion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, from that, uh, you have two kinds of freedom. Freedom from harm, things that stop you getting your way, and freedom to achieve your purposes. Uh, that is protection and empowerment to do things. And uh, those two types of freedom are crucial, but they're f with everybody. And freedom of action is understood in terms of freedom of motion. So if you think of the metaphors, for example, um, you know, you're in chains when you're not free. You're tied down. Uh, you're hemmed in. You're blocked off. You're uh, weighed down. I mean, those, those are things that in, uh, stop you from being free. Okay? They are from the, the domain of motion. So you understand freedom of action as freedom of motion. And then um, what happens in government? The question is, what kind of government allows you to be free from harm and free to fulfill yourself? If you're th at this point, uh, two different modes of thought come in, conservative thought and progressive thought. And they're very, very different. And they give different ideas. If you're a progressive, you see the role of government as having two fundamental roles. Freedom from, which is protection. Freedom to, which is empowerment of citizens. And that is, you know, what government is there for. And from that, you get uh, notions of fairness and equality and so on, all of which are contested concepts, too, which follow from that view. What is taxation? Tax taxation is what you have to pay to live in a country like America where you have protection, not just by the army and the police, but you have environmental protection, consumer protection, worker protection, safety nets, uh, pension protection. It should be uh, health care. Um, you have empowerment, not just roads and not just uh, satellite communication systems, but empowerment through uh, the banking system uh, uphold, upheld by the federal government, through uh, the stock market, through courts, which are mostly from corporate law. No business person can make a dime in this country without empowerment by the government and protection. What you pay in taxes is you pay for those things in America which aren't there in Chad or Bangladesh and many other countries. Right? Taxation has to do with the maintenance of freedom. And you don't hear progressives saying it, even though when you mention it to them, they say, yes, of course. It's important that it be said. But that has to do with freedom in all of its dimensions. and then. 
uh, you know, you, you get corresponding freedom in economics and so on. Mm -hmm. Conservatives have a very different idea. Conservatism is about discipline and authority and obedience to a, to a legitimate authority. And there, freedom comes from accepting the authority and from obeying that authority. So you're only free within that authority. And um, freedom uh, has to do with uh, the question of um, uh, are you disciplined enough to uh, function, let's say, in the market or in other realms of life to be able to follow that authority and also uh, to make a living, mm -hmm. take care of yourself, and so on. So their responsibility is individual responsibility, not social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And freedom has to do with individuals and individuals making it themselves in the market and so on. Uh, then in foreign policy, freedom is the spread of capitalism. And that's what it means for somebody like George Bush. I mean, it says that you are free to engage in business. And in order to be free to engage in business, you have to have institutions. Uh, like uh, free elections, because otherwise, um, you know, a dictator could take your money away. Mm -hmm. Well, he also says things like it's a God-given yes. right. That's not necessarily economic, though, is it? It's, uh, it's, it, is, it implies it. Uh -huh. It implies that the freedom is freedom to uh, make money in any appropriate way, to mm -hmm. start any kind of business, engage in any kind of entrepreneurial enterprise, uh, and so on. Well, let me ask you, uh, in your institute and in your work, um, how successful have you been in <laughs> having your, your, your very enlightened ideas actually make a difference in the political discourse of the country? Um, well, there are two sides of that. Uh, the positive, the, the glass is half full and half empty. The half full side is more than we ever dreamed. Uh, the 2006 election used uh, books like uh, Don't Think of an Elephant and Thinking Points and so on and helped get Democrats elected all over the country. And you see framing is understood everywhere now. And you see it very clearly in the current uh, presidential campaigns. Uh, so in that sense, we've succeeded. However, on the big job, we have not. The big job is to change the, the big ideas, the ideas about what government is, what security is, what the market is. Those are the big things, and we have not succeeded in that been a great conversation. Unfortunately, we've come to an end. <laughs> Very short. Thanks, thanks, for being, thanks for being with us. And we've been speaking with visiting lecturer George Lakoff, professor of linguistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks for watching.